Okay, thank you, Ben. So now our next speaker is uh, from academics. So he is um, Itama Simonson from Stanford University. If this is an academic conference, I don't waste my time to introduce who he is, but he is really the, one of the most influential researcher in consumer behavior, consumer insight, and decision making. Not only he's a wonderful researcher, but also he's a great teacher. For example, he has a numerous number of great students, including Ravi Dahl. <laughs> he actually got benefit uh, from, the, from the Itama. So Itama, today he's talking about something very interesting topic. In the, in the age of digital era, the consumers become smarter because they, when they go shopping, they, they can use lots of apps, lots of information. They can easily check the uh, price. They can compare the price. They can read the consumer reviews and so on. So, so, so he's talking about the rise of consumer rationality, become a smarter shopper, and the decline of brand royalty in the age of nearly perfect information. Uh, uh, thank you, Eugene. Uh, I'd like to talk today about uh, consumer decision-making in the age of uh, nearly perfect information. But before we get there, let's take a minute to review what we used to believe about consumers. In the beginning, the assumption was that consumers are generally rational, uh, but they have trouble assessing the quality of things, so therefore marketers could influence them using brand names and loyalty building, uh, advertising, and so on. Then about uh, 25 years ago or so, uh, we uh, conducted, many people conducted uh, studies that uh, showed that consumers are often irrational. They make inconsistent choices. They reverse their choices in, in uh, ways that, would, uh, that violated what economists uh, used to believe about consumer behavior. In fact, that was the main area of my research in the first 20 years of my career. Uh, l let me show you, this is an article that I published uh, in 94 in the New York Times, uh, and I think the title tells you what it was about and who I thought was uh, in control. I'll just show you a couple of examples uh, that were mentioned in, in this particular article. So in this particular experiment, uh, some consumers were asked to choose between $6 and this nice cross pen. Most people, by the way, took the $6. Another group of consumers was asked to choose between $6, the same cross pen, and another pen that most people find less attractive. Uh, what happened, as you might guess, in this group, a significantly higher number of consumers chose the cross over the $6, even though virtually no one chose the Schaefer pen. Why? Because while consumers, and including us, have trouble assessing the absolute value of things, such as the absolute value, how much uh, is a pen worth to us, we're very good at making comparisons. So depending on what I show you, I assess one relative to the other, and that leads to my decision in this case to, if you will, purchase this cross pen. Uh, at the time, actually let me go back. At the time I was talking to the vice president of marketing uh, of uh, William Sonoma, and he mentioned that they used to sell one bread maker for $279. Uh, and then they offered a second one, which was much more expensive, uh, $429, had almost the same features. The only difference was that it could bake breads of up to two pounds instead of a pound and a half. To their great surprise, while they didn't sell many of the more expensive ones, they doubled the sales of the less expensive one, which is really the same principle where consumers assess value relative to something else. Well, today, if you look at, uh, actually, if you, if you go to the Williams Sonoma website, you still find only two uh, bread makers. There is more information. I'm not showing everything here. Uh, you can l read some uh, reviews. You see that the cheaper one has uh, three stars, and the, the more expensive one has more stars. You can read the reviews. You, you have more information. But more importantly, a click away, you can go to all kinds of websites that sell bread makers. For example, Amazon has dozens of bread makers. I think this Panasonic happens to be their best-selling uh, bread maker. 
uh, you got here 786 reviews, average of four point uh, four and a half stars. Right there, we have a great deal of information. It's not too complicated to, to process that information. Uh, you have 254 answered questions. There, there is a lot more information. In other words, what happened here is that you can evaluate each product in absolute terms. You don't need to look at this, compare it to something else to figure out that you're getting value. Instead, you can assess each product individually in absolute sense. And that's a big difference. Let me, uh, what we did uh, last year, we tried to replicate this uh, pen effect that I showed you. It's referred to as the asymmetric dominance effect. Uh, with a doctoral student, Tali Reich, who actually is so good that he, she's joining the marketing faculty at, of Yale. And we, we had their different uh, groups, different conditions, but in one case, we showed them those two uh, sh uh, paper shredders, uh, and we provided some of the information that's available on Amazon. A second group saw the same two, and then a third one, and I don't know if you can see, if you look, this particular one here, is, uh, is dominated, is clearly inferior to the one in the middle. It's, it's more uh, cumbersome, uh, uh, more bulky, it, it doesn't shred as many, and so on. We didn't get the effect. In other words, adding this uh, shredder C did not increase the percentage of people who chose shredder B. Why? That's consistent with the conclusion that people can assess each product individually instead of having to rely on relative comparisons. Here is one more effect that, that I'll mention uh, known as the compromise effect. So in this particular example, and this is from the older days, you, you had a choice between those two cameras. A second group of consumers chose among three cameras, the same two and one more that has more features and is even more expensive. What happened here? Many people moved from A to B. They moved to the middle one. That's the tendency to go to the compromise option. The middle option in this particular set that you happen to see in front of you. That's another illustration of decision making in relative terms. You're not basing your decision on the absolute value of the middle option. Instead, you are choosing the middle one. Okay? Again, in the same study, we tried to replicate it last year. We, we showed two, we, we don't, you don't see all the information. We showed respondents, uh, one, some saw two uh, uh, cameras, uh, second group saw, saw three. Compromise effect was gone. Again, consumers can look at this product. They can look at all kinds of other cameras. They can get a lot of information. They no longer have to rely on relative comparisons. The implications of this trend are far-reaching, go well beyond the compromise effect or asymmetric dominance because much of marketing has been based on the creation of relative cues. If you think about, suppose you're buying a laptop in 1999, okay? So probably you, you were considering the brand name and where it was made, where it is sold. You might have uh, relied on some general rule like, uh, rules, like you get what you pay for. These are all relative proxies. Why? Because you assume that the product you're looking at now is of the same or similar quality as other products by the same brand at the same price level and so on. In fact, much of marketing has been about the creation of quality proxies. But when you no longer have to rely on proxies for quality and instead you can assess the quality of each product, not perfectly, but you, you can assess, my, then the influence of those proxies declines. Uh, these are, this is just a random selection of some of the information sources available today to, uh, to consumers for assessing products. Uh, and uh, that tells you something about the ability to assess each product in absolute terms uh, individually which means that much of the marketing textbook becomes less relevant because 
if you look at the marketing textbook, much of it is devoted to the creation of, as I'll talk about later, positioning and, and, and branding and, and loyalty and so on. Uh, let's let's uh, just review, uh, uh, to structure this discussion, let's think about what influences consumers' decisions. First, there is what we call peel, prior, whatever is stored in your head, what you're born with, your prior experience, your prior beliefs, and so on. Then there is M, that's the information provided to you by marketers, like advertising and, and brochures and, and, and so on. And the third one is others. Other people would include other users, uh, experts, information services, anything that comes from others at the time that you're considering making a decision. If you want a summary of what has happened in the past 10, 15 years, it's a shift from M to O. The impact of M, of marketers' decline, the impact of O is, has increased. I wouldn't go into that, but there's reason to believe that the impact of P, of the impact of what we have stored in our head is also declining when we are bombarded by so much information coming from, from uh, others. Now, as you might be saying to yourself, that doesn't apply to all products. And that is certainly true. Each product, and even within the product category, there might be differences across brands, uh, in terms of the importance of, oh, the importance, for example, of reviews. There are many products, like uh, Frito-Lay products, uh, where people don't check for reviews before they, they decide whether uh, to buy. And, uh, you know, hangers, paper clips, uh, quite a few products, may, including many products that are in the supermarket, uh, that would, at least time, uh, not apply to, although other products like diapers, it, it probably would. So it really varies. We call that the O continuum. Uh, most of my talk from now on will be about the O dependent side of things, which is a growing category. These are categories where decisions are significantly influenced by information sources from others. What, what are the implications of what I discussed? I'll talk very quickly. Uh, I'll talk about branding, loyalty, irrationality, uh, positioning, targeting, and persuasion, market research. I will not talk about drivers of innovation, just due to time limitations. Now, probably the biggest thing, there is nothing more marketing than branding. Uh, and, and if you think about why MBAs are still taking marketing classes, uh, branding is a big part of it because that's the one thing that's unique to marketing. Uh, and, uh, and, and many people believe that, if anything, what has changed in the world made brands more important, lot, not less. The argument goes as follows. It says, well, there is so much information out there. Consumers experience information overload so they cannot process all that information. Instead, they just rely on brands. <coughs> that argument assumes that consumers just have two options. Either they process all the information or they go by brands. But of course, consumers have many intermediate options. You don't need to spend a lot of information, a lot of time to, uh, to figure out what others are saying about the product. Let's take one, one, one example from the domain of restaurants. Chain restaurants used to have an ex uh, advantage over independent restaurants that you knew, where regardless of location, you knew what you're going to get. Now, if you look at, at uh, independent restaurants, this particular one from Seattle, uh, Restaurant Machiavelli, uh, you see how many reviews they got. It doesn't take a whole lot of cognitive effort to see what others are saying. If you'd like, if you're interested, especially in the opinions of those who are more negative, it doesn't take a whole lot of effort. You have, I forget, over 50 uh, photos of dishes. You have a great deal of information. Indeed, a study uh, conducted by Michael Luca showed 
that after Yelp penetrated the Seattle market, revenues of chain restaurants declined, whereas revenues of independent restaurants increased. This has far-reaching implication. One thing it means is that no-name brands can now, now have a chance to establish themselves. For example, Asus, where they used to make uh, components for other PC manufacturers, had no name recognition. Uh, when we talked to their CEO, he said, well, the no, to everyone told me, no chance, you're just wasting your time, you'll need to spend a lot of money on advertising. And, and even then, you'll be unsuccessful. Asus today is among the top five in the world in categories such as notebooks, uh, tablets, and, and other products. Uh, if you look at other known names, so there are now leaders like Roku, uh, Nest, uh, I guess now it's part of Google, I think. Uh, and, and you see names that we never heard about, uh, ne never heard about, they had a good product, the word got out, and they established themselves. It also means that one of the rules that we told people was that if you have a strong brand, it's probably associated with one particular category because consumers assume that each brand has skills to produce a certain type of product. So you shouldn't diversify too much using the same name. However, what we find is that in this world, when consumers can assess equality uh, it, of each product individually, there's really no reason that a company like LG or Samsung or any other company will be in many categories, as long as each product on its own is, is performing favorably and getting favorable O opinions. I should note that, uh, that I'm not saying that brands are, you'll be glad to know that brands are, are going away. Uh, brands will continue to have uh, uh, important functions uh, such as awareness and if you are selling a status product like Louis Vuitton, it certainly will continue to have important functions. However, arguably the most important function of brands is to communicate or to signal quality. That function is declining in importance. Loyalty. We, many books have been written about the importance of building loyalty, and we are familiar with those calculations, lifetime value, and if you increase loyalty by 2%, it will increase your, your profit by 500%, and, and to exaggerate slightly. Uh, uh, well, in this world, loyalty becomes also less important. I may really like my current car, but that doesn't mean that the next time I buy a car, I'll, I'll buy the same brand. I'm going to look around and see what people are saying, what's the best car right now, and that's what I'll buy. When can you evaluate, when you can evaluate the quality of each product individually, loyalty and prior experience become less important in determining purchase decisions. Now, for example, in the domain of uh, hotels, there is one study showing that there is a, a sharp decline in loyalty. Uh, so uh, that's actually what I already said, uh, that uh, uh, consumers are less likely to rely on their prior experience. On the bright side, even if you failed with one product, you have a better second chance, because if your next product is good, uh, it will be uh, well received. It also means that all those measures that we spend so much time on, you know, all those you know, uh, long-term brand perceptions, uh, net promoter score and so on, are becoming less important and less predictive of future, uh, uh, future purchase decisions. If you, if you have taken any, uh, and I'm sure all of you have taken and maybe taught uh, a, a marketing course, you know that nothing is more important as positioning. Uh, uh, because positioning, once you decide how you want your product to be perceived in the marketplace, that determines the rest of your marketing strategy, etc. That was true when a marketer could control how the product is perceived. When marketers have less power to influence perceptions, 
then positioning becomes less important. A number of companies, for example, tried to, to position their uh, cell phones as the Facebook phone. It didn't work out. People looked at that phone, compared it to other phones on all the relevant criteria, and those phones didn't do so well in, in the marketplace. Uh, so in other words, uh, you know, positioning be becomes less important. Uh, I, I think that uh, top of mind becomes less important. I don't think that we have time to go through all of that. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I think that uh, you, you're probably getting the sense that marketers are in a weaker position, and that may be a little contrary to some of the other things we heard uh, today. Uh, but marketers are in a, in a weaker position today to influence uh, uh, to, to influence consumers. Uh, we talked a little bit about personalization today, and many marketers say this is the wave of the future. Uh, we don't have time to go to all the psychological reasons of that. I think that the impact of personalization is overrated. You can, if, if you know, if you're selling wine and you know that I like Shiraz wine, Sure, that will help you, and you can target your ads. Uh, you can offer me Shiraz wine. Great idea. Okay, so that I'd call that uh, trivial personalization. If you know more about me, maybe you can be, and you know that I'm looking for a car. Uh, that is, you know, you can be more effective. I think there are great limits to the impact of personalization. For one thing, people's own preferences are still, even in the age of nearly perfect information, preferences have not changed. They're still malleable, unstable. Consumers don't have good insights into their own preferences. So the idea that you'll give people the perfect thing and it will click, I think is, is uh, somewhat uh, exaggerated. Uh, I don't have much time to talk about market research, but let me just mention, much of market research has been about predicting, uh, uh, measuring consumer preferences today in order to predict what they will buy in the future. That becomes, this fundamental principle of market research also becomes less effective. Because you can measure my preferences today, it's not very predictive of what I'll buy uh, let's say uh, in a few months or in a few years because at that time I'm going to look around see what others are saying that's not something that you can measure in other words my own me the preferences that you can measure have less impact on my ultimate purchase uh, decisions you know and there is one uh, famous study you might have heard about about uh, by a very large uh, research company uh, that predict that predicted that the iPhone will do poorly and it's not suitable for developed countries. Uh, as you might have heard, it turns out to be inaccurate. <laughs> uh, uh, again, I'm sorry for referring uh, to time so much, but as you could tell from my earlier examples, Consumers are not smarter, and I don't think that many consumers have taken courses on rational decision making. Uh, but, having said that, because of the changing information environment, they are less likely to make the kind of decisions that we labeled irrational in the world before the Internet. Uh, and we can talk about, if, if people are interested in that, much of that has to do with the fact that consumers used to rely on relative comparisons, which is really the source of much of the irrationality that we have documented, and now make absolute evaluations, which are much less susceptible to uh, uh, demonstrating irrationality. Uh, these are the things I talked about. The fundamental uh, difference is, or the fundamental change, is a switch from relative to absolute. And that really drives all the other changes that I talked about. Uh, quality proxies are becoming less important. Marketers are becoming, and that may be contrary to what uh, some of the things that you know, many marketers say, 
marketers for many products, not all products as I said, are becoming uh, less powerful. In fact, wouldn't surprise me if over time we'll find that the marketing function is, is declining in certain categories. Uh, I think this is a good time to re-examine in many categories what are the roles of marketing, what marketers can do. There are a lot that they can do. For example, running experiments uh, in real time is much easier today uh, uh, than it used to be. Uh, tracking what people are doing, what people are saying in real time, that's becoming easier and we see that marketers are getting better at that. Uh, at the same time, some of the traditional roles of marketing, brand building, loyalty building, in many categories are becoming less important. Thank you. Hold on for the mic. Oh, thanks. Hi, Mark DeMiro, North Star. Just a question regarding how consumers are really defining choice now or choosing, right? So one per perspective, is, as you put forth, is that they're looking at what their friends are doing, being influenced by the O, right? But to what extent are consumers also influenced by the perception of fit of a brand to their, to their needs? In other words, um, that product's right for me because blank, because I'm a you know, natural organic consumer, therefore I'm looking for that type of choice. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I, I think I do. Uh, and and I, I think what, you, what you're saying is that certain brands, let's say, are emphasizing environment, and I'm pro-environment, so therefore I like your brand. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. It's perception of fit. Yeah. So, so it, I mean, the argument is, is that marketers can influence perception of fit, and that's a new dimension that perhaps... If consumers actually are behaving in this particular example in environmentally friendly way and that's what others confirm yeah then it could work that's more based on the real quality if you will the real behavior of marketers that influences what others are saying on the other hand if marketers claim something that is not supported by evidence and the word gets out and as we know right now today things spread out very quickly then it's not going to work. And that's exactly what I mean by absolute value. You no longer can claim to be, say, environmentally friendly. Um, be, sure. And so on, yeah. No, that's great. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks.